Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight on this beautiful Tuesday evening. I'm so happy it's light out. Love the sunshine. And hi, baby. <laughs> oh my gosh. I know. So young <laughs> baby. Yes, that's right. Start them young. Start them young, <laughs> indeed. Love it. All right, so as you know, we have wonderful books tonight for you, so please don't forget to get that. And can we all just collectively acknowledge that we are on the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. And we do benefit from living and working on this land, and we are uninvited guests, so let's do our best to take care of this space, this place, and this land that we are occupying. I want to give huge thanks to our unseen labor here at the library. Media services, not so unseen, but yay, media services. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. Our amazing custodial team who does all of this hard work of setting up all the chairs and the tables and all of this cleanup. They are Thank amazing. You. So yay for them. And our security staff who keeps us safe here in the library. So unseen labor is super important. Try to make sure we think of them all the time. Um, I'm excited tonight for this event. This is part of our One City, One Book campaign. If you were here on Saturday, you got to see the amazing author talk with Catherine Ma. But if you missed it, that's okay. She will be at Ortega June 1st and Chinatown June something. We have a brochure of all of the other One City, One Books happenings, and this is part of this, but it's also part of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So we have a lot of things going on. Check us out, sfpl.org. If you're looking for something, just Google SFPL and whatever you're looking for, and it will pop up. So tonight we're here to celebrate Nancy Kim and Parini Sharoff for their two novels, Nancy's novels. The novel is What We Kept to Ourselves, and Parini's is The Bandit Queen. Um, Nancy Kim is the New York Times bestselling author of What We Kept to Ourselves, and the last story of Minna Lee. The last story of Minna Lee was long listed on our last year's One City, One Book. Um, it is also a Reese, Reese's Book Club pick. Nancy was born and raised in Los Angeles and now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. And her books are really fun to read. It's a weekend read. So no. quick, you'll love it. <laughs> Karini Sharaf received her MFA from the University of Texas at Austin where she studied under Elizabeth McCracken, Alexander Chi, yay, Alexander Chi, <laughs> and Christina Garcia. She is a practicing attorney. We won't hold that against her. Thank you. And currently lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Fair. The Bandit Queens is her debut novel. Everyone welcome, Nancy and Shirley. Thank you so much. This is incredible. Thank you, Anissa. You are extraordinary. We've been talking for a long while, and we made it happen. So we're so grateful to you and San Francisco Public Library and all of you for being here today. This is like a gorgeous day, and yet we're all in air conditioning. So <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for taking for taking time to be a part of this event with us, especially you know on a Tuesday and when it's 70 outside. So it's a sacrifice, and we're... We're hoping to make it a fun time, and we're hoping the Prosecco does some of that uh, lifting for us. So we hope you all got a free book. Um, Perini and I, we wrote two very different books. Uh, Perini's book is about a, a group of women who are living in extraordinarily oppressive conditions within a, in a rural village in India. Um, and murder is very much a part of the plot as these women devise ways to sort of break free from the constraints that are put on them in everyday life. And uh, my book is about a Korean American family in Los Angeles that unravels when um, a mother disappears and a dead stranger is found in the backyard. And so we have two very different, exciting premises. Perini's book is super, super funny if you haven't read it yet. It's hilarious. It's absurdist, it's wild. Mine is a little bit more serious, but it's got bits of humor in it. Um, our books are so different on the surface. Mine takes place in the city of Los Angeles, hers in a rural village. Mine takes place in America and hers in India, but at the heart of both stories are outsiders. Women who are struggling to exert control over their lives, both spiritually and financially, against systemic and often violent odds. 
Both of our books are also about friendships or alternative families, finding families outside of what a normal family kind of, or what we kind of think of traditionally as a family. And there, there are also two books about the power and hold that stories have over us. Stories can be both forms of oppression and liberation. Um, there's two women at the heart of both of our books, Gita and Sunny, women who might seem familiar to us as our mothers or aunties or friends, but they're finding ways to create their own freedom through art or murder. <laughs> hey, what, you know, one's quicker than options. the other, but yeah. I don't know. They both actually take yeah. quite a bit of work. But <laughs> so, you know, this reminded me of something that showed up in my Instagram feed today, uh, which I always feel really silly quoting Instagram, but it's just going to show up anyway, is there's this quote that showed up from Toni Morrison's Sula, which is an extraordinary book. And yeah, come on, we all love Toni Morrison. Um, this quote, which is like any artist without an art form, she became dangerous. And so I think both of our books absolutely <laughs> are absolutely really about women who are finding ways to express themselves as individuals within societies that don't that kind of depend upon their erasure, the erasure of their labor, yes. as we talked about unpaid labor earlier. Thank you, Anissa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the erasure of their humanity, of their emotional range, of the expansiveness of who they can be. So I would love, Perini, if you set us up with uh, a little bit for your passage that you could read. And so we can all get a kind of tone, idea of the tone and the voice that we've got going here, which is very, I mean, this, this book is hilarious. So it's like... I thank you so much for for that wonderful introduction and like tying in the you know the, the the different works that we've created that really circulate and address so many of the same overlapping issues regardless of setting and time. And um, what I'm going to read, the Band of Queens is hopefully a, a funny, a dark comedy, a funny novel. Um, I hope those of you, if, if anybody's here today who's joining us has read it did have a chuckle or 50. Um, but the passage I'm going to read will tie into what Nancy was speaking about a moment ago about um, women uh, you know, denied access to expression and where they go from there. And so this passage, um, reading it, uh, I don't often read it. It takes place in the penultimate chapter and that's probably why, but... Um, Let's go. It follows uh, the myth of the witch, or in Hindi, the churel, and the various legends that vary on accounts, but kind of all lead back to a, a woman wronged. The provenance of a churel is a woman wronged, a pregnant woman's demise, death at the hands of a vicious in-laws or a violent husband, dying during childbirth or within the 12-day period of impurity afterward. Whenever a woman died grossly unfulfilled, she'd return as a churel. Those surviving her could attempt to stymie her transformation, bury her rather than burn her, weigh her down with stones, dress her grave with thorns, set her in the ground face, face down so as to disorient her, were that she be given such healthy regard in life, rendering such measures moot. Nevertheless, if her revenge lust was potent enough, she'd find her way home, and so it would begin. Men were to fear her, but their stories varied. She'd lure them to a hillside lair where her fangs drain them of all bodily fluid, semen included. She'd hold them prisoner, demanding repeated coitus until they withered. Some died, some stumbled home, gray and wrinkled, suffering a strange and sudden dotage. A witch, a banshee, a succubus. Men who survived an encounter with her shared consistent details as to her appearance. On this point, the stories no longer varied. Her true form was always hideous. Long black tongue, sagging breasts leading to a pot belly, matted hair, both of the head and pubic variety, and feet twisted backward. Seeing as how this image was not conducive to sirening prey, the trail disguised herself. She could transform into a young and comely woman, but was unable to hide her deformed feet, the telltale mark of a virago. Geetha and Saloni had always assumed this was a cautionary tale written by men for men, only a man would imagine retribution wrapped in lust rather than just painful death. Only a man would morph a wounded woman into a hideous monster. Only a man would then, for the sake of phallic pride, attribute her with shape-shifting powers so that the creature he'd laid down with over and over again was deceptively gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. 
Uh, I love how I think both of our books at their core, I mean, at on the sort of surface level, we have this kind of, I have a mother who disappears mm -hmm. and you actually have a husband that disappears. Yes. Isn't that fascinating? It is. We were. What is up? Like nobody should trust this ever again. <laughs> No. I kind of feel like, how do our parents, like, what I, do our parents think of this? They're like, where, where do we go wrong? Somewhere on the five-year mark, maybe. Uh, but I, I love, like, the missing woman, the, the, dis, the disappearance in your novel. I wrote something that's going to be far more eloquent than I am going to be off the cuff. But um, the, like, the erasure of the missing person element as a, as a kind of a metaphor for the way women disappear after motherhood. Like, Sunny is... Uh, like there's two timelines, which I, I want to delve into a little bit later into our discussion, but Sunny is the protagonist, like a very close protagonist, at least, at least to, to me, but, um, and part of the novel she's gone and in part of the novel we're very, uh, intimate with her and that idea of her going missing after becoming a mother and the erasure of women after motherhood, but also the erasure of women like Sunny. You know, you, I, there's a wonderful line that I'm not gonna be able to do to, ser to be able to do service to you, but it talks about how people like her are invisible, immigrant, foreign, not English speaking, and the idea of just like being sucked into air and then nothing. And so the erasure element really struck me and I, I wanted to hear you talk about that. Well, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, I started this book over 20 years ago. Um, and I wrote it, I began it as my father died actually, so we have missing dads and fathers who pass away. My father actually died in a car accident. And this, uh, my, my parents were estranged and they were divorced. And in some ways this book begins from the point of view of this father who is unknowable to the children because he has spent his entire life working very, very hard. And all they know is this hardworking first generation Korean American man who doesn't talk about any of his wounds or his trauma or the horrifying things that he experienced in war. He doesn't really have the language to talk about those things. And so we have this unknown father, but the mother, she kind of explains explicitly disappears because I think she realizes at some point as her as her children leave to find themselves it's time for her to go after herself too and the woman that she buried when she came to this country all of the dreams she had as an artist the many people she was before she became a mother and suddenly she came to this country like my mother herself who simply became my mother you know and it's kind of devastating and so for me you know in fiction Plot and character development, all of those things are kind of metaphors for kind of the larger themes that I'm discussing. And for me, I actually really was able, so I said I said I started this book 20 years ago. I was actually able to finish it during the pandemic after I had a child myself. And I felt myself slipping away oh. as a mother. And so my life began to align with my characters and I started to see my, to sort of question who I will be after spending, uh, getting on this merry-go-round that is a baby, a baby. I see there's a beautiful baby in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> but all of us started off that way, so we should all like you know you know have as much grace as possible towards these beautiful babies. Who yes, they do take up a lot of our time. And really, the problem is a society that doesn't support women oh, yeah. enough. Not the babies themselves, not motherhood. Mm -hmm. The motherhood is not the issue. It's a society that doesn't support working families, people with children that uh, need to rely on private private funding, need to rely on being able to pay salaries towards entire staff. Um, and so Sunny is a woman who out of no choice, but the sort of constraints of the world that she lives in, in Los Angeles as an immigrant, she has to erase herself so that her husband can work because his labor is considered more valuable. And we still live in that world, you know? And so for me, this is a very personal story in a sense that it was a journey of forgiving my own father who passed away 20 years ago. And it was also a journey towards reclaiming myself through writing a book about a woman who has to figure out who she is again now that her children are gone. So she needs to disappear in order for her kids to understand who she is and, and vice versa. Yeah. So, I mean, her disappearance is what sparks a curiosity into who she is and was. That's when they go on this like, hunger almost for details that they never, I mean, they didn't ask about because we don't, I mean, I'm not blaming the children either because I'm, I'm the same way. My mother is my mother and you kind of have this um, myopic vision, right? It's like, I started, you started when I came here and it's so not, it's so not true, but it's the kind of 
innocuous conceit that, that we, the children, the children have. And so I'm really, I'm late to the party, but I'm actually being more voracious about asking my mother questions. That's so great. And being like, tell me more. And <laughs> then know. using them as fodder in my novel because <laughs> I am savage. That's um, so wonderful. But, so thank you for that. that. I am very like, oh, tell me. Yeah, I yeah. think the literal disappearance of the mother in this book, I mean, she disappears. Like at the beginning of the book, she's been gone for a year. So we don't know where she is. Is the kind of pres- It's a kind of metaphor for the way she's been gone this whole time. So all they know about her is her as a mother and the food that she makes and, the, you know, the beautiful ways that she loved them and the ways she sort of sacrificed herself. But she has no idea who's hiding beneath, you know, the surface of who they want her to be and who they need her to be. And so I find this really fascinating as a woman, as a mother myself. And I think, uh, you know, it, it pushes us to, you know, my father, he passed away. Uh, I can't ask him questions I would love to ask him. At the same time, I am still able to investigate who he is as a human being, even though he wasn't a great dad. My parents, I mean, to be quite honest, weren't the parents that I needed growing up, Mm -hmm. but I see them through the process of reading and writing about parents like mine who struggled to, uh, uh, like just the circumstances they went through as children of war. I mean, really, I mean, they, my mother was, my parents were four years old and 13 at the time when they had to flee their homelands and a horrible, horrible war that left millions of people dead. And for them to have experienced this as children to, to be able to parent me as a child, I mean, would have been a miracle, you know? And so as parents, I've learned to, I mean, as a child, I've learned to sort of hold them as human beings with very complicated stories within a time period that was very, very unfortunate. But that doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, I look back in retrospect and my mom was like, wonderful. Do you know what I mean? No, I do. That's not what healing yes, is. Yes, exactly. And she was extraordinary in her own right, regardless of the many ways and the many regrets that that she probably has. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I mean, in a way you've, in a way you've already answered this question just now, uh, but just to praise you, when I was reading the novel, John, the father, uh, the husband of Sonny, who, who does, who disappears, uh, John comes initially comes across as unlikable and uh, uh, abrasive. He has a temper. He's short with his children. He's so focused on providing for his family and surviving that living is kind of off the table, enjoying his family, talking to them, discussing emotions, that's all off the table because the focus is on getting to the next day. And I love unreliable narrators and I love unlikable characters. And so, but I think execution is so difficult. I love reading them because I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. But I think the craft from a craft perspective, I'm like, wait, how do you do that? and so I'm in awe, I think, when writers read and enjoy no- other novelists' books. We we read for that pleasure, but we also read to be like, how did you pull it off? Teach me. And so with, with John, I'm just in, I'm in awe of how you balance the initial unlikability. And then when we get a bit closer to John, we see the PTSD. We see the survivor's guilt he's grappling with every day, just holding it together with like gritted, like white knuckling gritted teeth. And that balance I think was just so beautifully done, Nancy. I, I, I really tried to dissect, I mean, I loved reading your novel, but I really tried to dissect it to be like, what can I glean? And I, I was just like, ah, no, it's just chef's kiss. You can't just, you can't shut that brain off. It's like the immigrant or the immigrant's child's brain. You know what I mean? Like we're just always working, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 hustle, hustle. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really fascinating. I mean, I felt that way about your characters, too. I mean, we have uh, (laughs) such interesting. I mean, we have, you know, we have a group of women who are in it. This is a micro loan group, which is so fascinating. All of these women are so skilled and and, and fascinating in their own right. And they're kind of navigating friendships. And, you know, when you live in a society that is morally questionable, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Kind of all, you know, you you kind of, it allows, and when you, when you frame the society as showing that some of these behaviors are kind of built into it, it, it relieves the characters as individuals a little bit. And I think both of our books do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I, I, I think do. we're interested in, in individuals as sort of symptoms, as sort of, my, or families as microcosms of societal problems at large. Do you know what I mean? So we have women who are, 
murdering uh <laughs> as one does just these little crimes but what is happening to them every day i mean they are subjected to these cruelties that is that are unimaginable you know for the average person who is probably reading this book in english um i mean there are some really really dark dark topics that we get into from you know systemic prejudice to misogyny to you know sexual violence i mean it's your book covers the whole range so yeah. i mean how this is what what makes your book so unique i think is is that you kind of uh, you know i think in both of our books the systems that these people are in are Absolutely. major characters yeah. in the book like i'm interested in how uh, Asian American family, a Korean American family is complicit in white supremacy, you know, in my book, right? Yeah. And then you have forms of misogyny amongst these women as they kind of call each other names, make all sorts of, <laughs> they compete against each other, they make really petty comments. It's that like classic ca cattiness yeah. that I think is a kind of embodiment of the misogyny that is part of the larger culture. Absolutely. But at the core, they're friends. So what I'm, I'm really curious about in your book is how do you handle this with, I mean, how did you approach humor in this? It is so funny. You would think that the things that we are talking about, it's like, this is going to be like this, like, Just horrifying, depressing. like that. Bleak read. You know? yeah. Like yeah, the worst ending. Just like everyone's gonna die at the end. You know, yeah. I wrote that draft. It sounds, <laughs> but it is so. I mean, and it switches so quickly from funny to being very serious, yeah. and it takes us all along the way. And it's hilarious. It's got like this because I'm from Southern California, so there's this like Valley Girl vibe. Like, yeah, <laughs> to yes. the language, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you balance that? I mean, what? Uh, I think a lot of things were at play when the, the Band of Queens started off as a short story, which was all the dreary things you just listed with like none of the humor. And it was a short story that was like, okay, this is this. And I put it away in a drawer and I was fine, moved on with my life for a decade. And then during the pandemic, um, a friend suggested I reread it and I did. And all of a sudden I was so, I was so curious about these characters and I was like, oh, if I have questions as the author, maybe there's a larger world here. And so I set to creating a novel and that's when the humor crept in. And I think it was partly because I missed my own friends during lockdown. Like we were, um, I stayed from each other. And I also started to see that the humor was rather than um, undercutting the serious topics, it was elevating it. And it was, we were able to go, we were able to handle these impossible situations that these women are put in, such as domestic violence and casteism, because they had each other to, I mean, ideally band together, but you're right. There is a level of cattiness where they're insulting each other. They're wasting yes. time insulting each other before they stop pointing fingers and start to band together to think of how do we get out of this instead of how do just I get out of this? And that movement from self-preservation and tribalism, like my family, to the greater whole and like our this cadre of women, my group, how do we survive? Not just how do I get through this? Because how I get through this is putting you down. I oppress you and therefore I'm standing on your neck as opposed to how do none of our necks get, um, get stepped on. That became kind of a, that with the humor became kind of a thread throughout the novel. And to your point with the language, there is a very Valley Girl-like, <laughs> Insinuation. So in my mind, the characters are never speaking English except for when it's explicitly said. I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. They're in a village in rural Gujarat. They're speaking Gujarati, but there is an equivalent of a filler word, which is what like is. Like, um, well, are all filler words. And so I was thinking, wait, instead of just using that as a translated word, uh, excuse me, as the, as the Gujarati word, how about I just use the translation and in that sense, hopefully when you read these passages where the women are getting together and snarking and, and you know, moaning and before they kind of put their heads together and actually do some work, uh, it sounds like you're overhearing any group of friends. I really, despite this very specific setting of um, this fictional village in Gujarat, I wanted you to see these women anywhere because the themes are ubiquitous. And yes, they're an extreme in the novel, but they're around us. Um, prejudice exists right here at home. Yes. Um, casteism is following us here, unfortunately. Uh, so does domestic violence and the patriarchy. And so I wanted you to just be able to think, oh, I'm hearing any, I'm hearing my own friends. I'm overhearing anybody talk, not necessarily women in an Indian village. So that, that's where the choice for the dialogue 
came. Yeah, and I think it's a really brave and interesting choice. I mean, there's because there's this fine line between, I think it's a commentary on, I mean, the absurdity of us all holding up these structures that benefit everyone's kind of miserable, you know? <laughs> so who is actually being benefited from all of this, like, horrible, horrible stuff that's happening in the world? You know, so it's just this kind of absurdness that is kind of like absurdity that is really kind of emphasized through the humor, which I think oh, works you. brilliantly together. Thank and I'm sure was all intentional. Oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> of course. Nothing, that was just, like, on the real yeah. intent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing by accident. So, um, I, I think I'm going to, do you want me to do a little bit? I would reading? love for yeah. you to read the passage okay. we were talking about before so the event started. I wanted to read a little bit, kind of connecting with Perini's book about women, women who are struggling to find themselves. I'm just going to read a little bit and then you can kind of hear, you know, the differences in our styles. And I always just think that's kind of nice, but love it. So this is Sunny. This is in 1998. And this is right when her uh, two adult children have, have left the home and she's kind of re rediscovering her her past as an artist, but she's also kind of confronting her history and the relationship she might have lost and she might have not processed since coming to America. I think something that happens in America very conveniently is this kind of forgetting that becomes a requirement sometimes to working as hard as we do in this country. I mean, our, our families work so hard, right? I mean, it's like to the point where it, um, it's almost a necessity to survive the other every day um, through forgetting, through not sharing our stories, because really that takes a lot of time. And really, not only does it take a lot of time, but there's also a lot of pain and things that you have to explain to your children and you realize how big the gulf is between you and your kids. You know, so it's kind of this kind of culture of denial that we're kind of up against. So I wanted to just read a very short passage because I love it in a lot of ways, but, um, one warm evening in early October, Sunny journeyed to the usual art supply store in Koreatown, the only one she had been able to find dusty and crowded and delightful as an antique shop. She loved its smell of mineral and chalk, the plastic of erasers and the wood dust from pencils being sharpened, which reminded her of her father, his silence in front of the easel as he mixed and smeared colors on the palette. This level of intimacy had only been surpassed by when she had fed her babies in the middle of the night as they slept in her arms and received a warm bottle like a dream. Or when she stood in the kitchen preparing meals for her children and Ronald would hang on her legs and beg for a bite of the chewy noodles that she had just rinsed in the sink. She coiled them around the tips of her fingers before placing them between his tiny teeth. His dark brown eyes lifted in approval. She missed their giant littleness their grand eagerness. And with Anna out of the house, the yearning to create had filled Sunny's life as her existence for the past 20 years, the hairy trips to school for drop-offs and pickups to the doctor's office, to the supermarket, slipped like sand between her fingers, despite how hard she squeezed them. In the sweep of time, which included her daughter's acceptance letter, her prom and graduation, Sunny realized that soon enough, Ronald would be next. Who knew where he would go, and could she blame him for wanting to leave this place, this home, which had, which had few comforts except for the food that she provided, and simply, from the outside world's perspective, Koreatown, a springboard for bigger and better? If Ronald moved away, she and her husband would be left with themselves in the business, which they needed to help the children until they were on their own financially, and to pay off all the loans and maintain the mortgage. In a shadowy aisle of the art supply store, she lingered near the expensive tubes of oil paints, the names of the hues that always sounded otherworldly, from cadmium red to burnt umber to yellow ochre. She decided to splurge on a small set for herself, carrying the colors like small gems. Although it had been years since she dabbled in the medium, she had been much more confident with watercolors and less expensive acrylics. She craved the opacity, the range, and brilliance of the pigments that, she could, that could be smeared and mixed on a palette, much like her father had. She would be, in a way, speaking to him through the brush. Thank you. <laughs> so I feel like... Yeah, a lot of this is about storytelling and reclaiming stories, you know? So I feel like that connects with the churl in a lot of oh, ways, oh, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And um, I mean, past representations, present representations, futures of all of who we used to be, like we carry that within us 
any given, I don't know, at any given moment. And when you were reading, it just really struck me. And I don't expect you to have an answer, but it makes me think, I think about this a lot. I'm like, how off, do I have a right to my generation stories? Like the, the, my predecessors, the, do I have a right to their stories? And especially when you consider John's silence with his, with his children and often they push and he, you mentioned he doesn't have the language. Um, but I also like wonder if they want to know. Yeah. Like once they like it, their lives are so their lives are so different. I'm not sure they want a window into that pain because John has been through. He's been through so much, right? Um, and all of us have, and I'm not in any way saying it's the same, but we all have. And I often wonder um, when my mother is maybe guarded or keeps things, and I'll, I'll push, and then I'll I'll stop. And I wonder, like, do I have a right to this? Do I have access to this just by virtue of being this woman's daughter? Do I have the right to, like, push this wound that is maybe not healed properly, that there's a scab? I'm like, what What stories do I have access to? What stories do I have a right to, like, stamp my foot and be like, no, you tell me. It's like, mm, I don't. So, any. That's such a brilliant question. I mean, I, oh, oh. right? I mean, it's like, we wonder this all the time. And I think that's the difference between you know, that's why we keep things to ourselves to a certain extent, because I think that, you know, some of it is ownership and, you know, you keep a story to yourself because you want to kind of protect your version of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So some of it is ownership and that could be selfish, but that could also just be survival, you know? And so it's a fascinating thing to think about, like, what do people owe us in terms of their stories? I think, as listeners and as storytellers ourselves, I think it makes sense that we're curious about what our parents have been through. But I find that people are always telling stories regardless of whether or not they're saying it directly. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, and I, I think that even though, like my father passed away when I was in my early 20s and I remember um, as an undergrad at UCLA, I took a lot of courses in Asian American studies. I was, a, I minored in Asian American studies and so I took an oral history, oral history, uh, project basically where I asked him about his life and he was born and raised in the north he was born in the north and he basically fled what is now North Korea during the Korean War and I asked him about his life and I felt as if he could never give me enough of what I needed do you know what I mean like he could present to me the information but there are always going to be pockets of like what I cannot understand about him and to a certain extent that is like part of life is accepting the limits of what someone can share with you. Do you know what I mean? I do. Wow. Yeah. So it's sort of like with our parents, like I have to come to terms with the fact that my dad died in this very sudden way. And I will always be left with all these absences of like not being able to communicate or connect with my family in North Korea because I don't know where their name, I don't know their names. I don't know where they're buried, you know, like things like that. And it's sort of like, I have to accept that my father needed to bury those things to keep living, you know? And I can do my own, I'm gonna have to work around that on some level, you know, in order for me to move on and to sort of maintain my sanity, you know? And so I think each of us is kind of in life negotiating how we're kind of reading into the silences within our families, maybe having a little grace over like why, like my mother who, my mother was uh, in the Korean War when she was four years old and she gives me snippets of the war, but she can only process it on a certain level because she was so young, right? And she has a different relationship to the war than I will ever, because from an outsider's perspective, it's like, I want more, I want more. But really her memory is, is sort of, uh, coded in all sorts of ways that I will never be able to understand because she had to survive all those things, you know, and I've never had to survive those things. And so a part of my growth as like a human being is accepting what she's willing to sort of give me on her own terms and sort of making peace with that absence, you know, realizing she's probably doing her best. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I do also think that it is an opportunity to ask if you have the, if you speak the same language, if you have the time to sort of get to know people who, who are living in your life and to sort of find ways that they're probably talking to you without you even realizing it. So, and I'm very grateful I did that oral history project with my father. I mean, you know, it's like extraordinary. I would have, I would have never known any of those things. I asked him about like, what was it like, like the first day that you landed in America? You know, you just never ask those things, right? Yes, that's incredible. That's you exactly. just never know. But then when you actually ask those things, you realize so many things about that human being. And you realize a lot about yourself and your own sort of origin story, right? So that's wonderful. 
I, I hear you and I'm like, she's just wise. I need to like, I was like, oh, I need to do that. I need to understand like, oh, capacity and like respecting that and like, okay. And oh, yeah, I, I love it. And um, I'm for my own selfish knowledge, I'm going to ask a, a little, a little bit of a lighter question, which is, um, does your mother read your work? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I love that question. Um, so my mother doesn't read English. My mother only speaks uh, English on the level of like a toddler, and I only speak Korean on the level of a toddler. Okay. So, and then in some ways, I feel like I became a writer partially because I would I knew that I would always have this space that really only belonged to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but my first novel was recently translated into Korean, and she and it was really really moving to send my mother my novel because my mother is not a reader. She has like she has no attention span for books. She loves drama. She loves <laughs> Korean yes. television, yes. <laughs> and so she has no uh, uh, capacity. So she's not like a reader of novels. And she read my book, and the things that stood out to her were really surprising and beautiful. Like she, like she said things like, you know, I expected her to be like, why does this mom in the last story of Mina Lee that begins with the death of a, a Korean American mother? She was like, you know, I expected her to be like, why is this mom's dead? <laughs> you know, or like, what are you doing? What is up with this mom? Like, what are you trying to say to me? I expect her to be mad, but instead she pointed out things that were like, I've never heard the ocean described that way. I thought that was really beautiful. You know, it was just like yeah. things that she can kind of cling to and kind of maybe that was more approachable to her than the Korean American single mom that was dead. That said, it kind of sounds like her, but like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, it's surprising her. What about you? Do your, does your family read your book? Um, my father recently read it. He doesn't care for fiction. And so yeah. he was like, I read it. And then there was just like the silence that you could just like, <laughs> Mortify. And I was like, Oh, and I, I mentioned something cause I was so, I'm not okay with silences. And so I was just like talking. I don't even know what I was saying. At some point I mentioned it was a comedy and he was like, it's a comedy. <laughs> and I was like, <sighs> and then I scampered away. Uh, but you know, it's like you just, you, oh. you accept them for who they are. Neither of my parents really read fiction. My mom hasn't read it, but she's out there like peddling it to anybody who will listen, you know, like that support, that is her, comfort zone that's her capacity and I love her for it like she like, like she came out and she bought like I don't even she has like so many copies Aww. and she's just like sends them like she sent one to Michelle Obama I don't even know how oh my gosh that's so cute she was like I just really think Michelle needs to read this book but she hasn't even read so it so she hasn't read it no 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 but she's heard great things uh she's just heard wonderful things from, about her daughter. Uh, so, so, so that, and it's just like, you know, the, they, they, they fiercely love me in the ways that they can. And you're just like, all right. And then, and so I, I, yeah, um, I don't think she'll, she'll ever read it, but she, I'm sure you all will get copies in the mail. I mean, if, at the rate she's going, there's not going to be a person in this country who doesn't have a copy sent to them. But, uh, it, yeah, no, um, hasn't, hasn't read personally. Yeah. That's fascinating. Do you want her to read it? I, I think I would because my parents divorced when I was quite young and a lot of the novel deals with the concept of a discarded woman. Like Gita starts the novel in such an isolated place because her husband disappeared on her. And in this village, in this area, um, her, not having a man tied to her lowers her reputation. Mm -hmm. And that's why she starts off as a social pariah. And um, my mom being, you know, divorced, an Indian woman in India divorced in the late eighties, early nineties, there was that level of ostrac ostracization. Yes. yes. And so I'd love her to read it just to see the triumph, if that makes sense. I'd love her to see, like, I saw you, I saw you doing it on your own and this is what I took away from it. And I hope I did you proud, you know, that kind of level. But nothing, yeah. nothing really other than that would strike me. Just like the kind of sheer badassery of the of the women. That's what I'd like her to see. Yeah. Because given her like proclivities towards television in terms of what she had me watch in the '90s, which was like Nine to Five <laughs> and First Wives Club, I'm like, I think I did. I think I took. I think I got the hint, Mom. Um, noted. Uh, so I think th that level, that kind of like women banding together and having fun and kind of taking down the patriarchy. I think that's, but if she can glean that without having read the book, then that's fine too. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I, I wonder how many, 
of our parents wonder about, you know, especially when you're in a, in a family where you speak different languages, right? It's such a fascinating uh, decision. I mean, how, how do you approach this kind of goes to the idea of, and I think we have, uh, we have time for questions. So I'm just going to ask this one question. How do you approach audience when you're writing? I'm curious about this. Oh, I, like, do you imagine someone, I don't know if there's any other writers out here, in the, you know, uh, but this is a question that comes up that in the past it was assumed that the audience all looked exactly the same, right? <laughs> but now we have an audience that could be really anyone. And so I think that, you know, fortunately things have gotten better in that sense that, you know, publishers are publishing so many more books, so much, so much more range in terms of the types of stories that we're seeing from people of color. But like, did you have an audience that you had imagined? I mean, did you, were you scared of that audience? Were you scared that people were going to read this and be like, ugh? I'm or always like, scared, Nancy. You're no, always scared. I'm always scared. <laughs> no, for varying reasons, but I'm just per- always scared. No, uh, it might be actually anyone. true, like low-level anxiety, but I, I try not to think about the audience, and I certainly wasn't thinking about the audience when I wrote The Bandit Queens. I was on the, I was reeling from kind of a, my first manuscript didn't sell, and it was just a, a bunch of, very nice nose that made me want to just like crawl on the bathtub and never get out. Um, just the kindest nose uh, where you actually think you're like, oh yeah, oh. <laughs> that went sideways. Um, and so I, I started writing the Band of Queens from just like this pit of despair because the rejections and then lockdown. And I was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever, like this is the, it's weird. You have Valley Girls in rural Gujarat. <laughs> killing men yeah. <laughs> and if they didn't want and I was thinking I'm like if they don't want that, that the they're pitch. not going to want this <laughs> so I was really writing for myself because what else was I going to do so I wasn't thinking of an audience because at that point I just felt rejected by like wow. the world so I wasn't to my I think now I look back on it it was probably to my advantage it's that I wasn't thinking thing. about yeah. an audience because yeah. I was like no one's going to want this so I might as well have fun and I did have fun and um, I think that's conveyed uh, hopefully when the audience wh- whatever the whoever whoever's hands the book falls into, I hope that fun is conveyed. But now having been published, it's a lot harder to avoid the idea of the audience and that gaze. Um, So it is probably impeding me in a way that didn't impede me during that. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I know. Well, that's the second book thing, right? So tell me everything is that my second book, which is this book, what we kept to ourselves was actually the first book that I wrote and I, and like that I started and it was rejected like 30 times, you know? So I went through the kindest nose thing to you. So that just goes to show that there is hope. (laughs) Thank you. Because I absolutely love this book too. I love it. I love this book. Um, it means so much to me and I, um, yeah, for me, audience, it's, it's so fascinating. You know, we, as women of color, we get kind of pushed in this weird, we get criticized by everyone. I mean, oh my goodness. It's like everyone's just like waiting to like just kind of yeah. attack us. It's really, really unfortunate. Um, my first book did so well that, you know, people were like, well, that's because she wrote this for white people. And I'm kind of like, you know, when I wrote this, I didn't think anyone was going to read this. Mm-hmm. I literally thought, um, I imagined the book that the 26-year-old version of me needed to read and the future version of me needed to read I was not thinking of I was not imagining or anticipating any sort of commercial success I just knew that I had to write this book to keep living I mean that's really where I was at I mean just completely and that I got picked up sure I got lucky I got all of those wonderful things happen and I'm grateful for them but it wasn't like I worked on this book for 10 years like cultivating this like audience that you know there wasn't any kind of like it was a very very personal and even political journey that that took me to writing this book and it's the same with my second book and it's hard because I think that you know the internet has made it a lot harder for us because the voices are everywhere right there it's just noise I mean you hear from everyone I mean I have people who are like reaching out to me who like Write me. I've I've gotten hate mail and I've I've um, oh, reach out to me and they even get all of my biographical details incorrect and they'll accuse me of like being a, having gone to an Ivy League and like being a snowflake and my political. <laughs> like, you know, and I'm like, honey, I have never been to Ivy League. <laughs> that would be. Jesus, <laughs> that's something that you the, do not assume that about everyone with a certain set, you know group of political values right. or whatever and so um the internet kind of exposes us to all kinds of things it does it makes so us it vulnerable requires a like a really different level of focus and yeah. so i still always imagine little nancy i always imagine the younger version of me and like what were the stories that i needed when i was growing up um in my 20s in my 30s even just thinking about 
what forms of representation am I not seeing? How am I not seeing myself in this world? And for me, the priority was kind of a working class, communities of color, Koreatown, single parent households, you know, people who are struggling but are nonetheless extraordinary, heroic, important uh, change makers. We don't see enough of that. And who aren't aspiring for wealth or aren't inspiring for, you know, fame or anything. They literally just want to make a difference in their families' lives, in their communities' lives. And I, you know, that was kind of always my goal. But because of the way we kind of get pushed out, I think that, you know, we get spun in different ways that is really unfortunate. And we, I feel like the attacks can come from literally everyone at times. And it's, it's, it's brutal. I mean, it, it really is. It can be. The love is also wonderful. It is. You, you know, you just, there's yeah. access to you in ways that we didn't have access to authors. Yeah. X many years ago. I mean, and so you can just wake up to hate mail or you can wake <laughs> up to someone saying, this book changed my life. Thank you so much. It helped me heal. It helped me leave a bad marriage. It helped me yeah. do all these things. I, I mean, mean, you're just like, wow, I would never, both spectrums, you would never have that access to someone's, yeah. someone who wrote a work that you, that fell into your And either you way know. it can be overwhelming, right? I mean, yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, obviously I prefer one. <laughs> Over the so other. So, anyone wants to send us is, love letters via the internet, we are here. We yeah. are open. My yeah. inbox is empty. <laughs> <laughs> because, believe it or not, I mean, it's like the people who are like happy and like love your book, they're like less likely, I think. You know what I mean? It's almost like that kind of that thing that happens on Yelp and the internet, you know what I mean? Where it's like, if you don't like something, then you complain. Yeah. But absolutely. everyone else who like quietly enjoyed it, like, isn't going to bother to leave like a five star or whatever, you know? So, all right. Well, that was. Wait. Fun. Thank Are you there, so much. Yeah. I didn't even scratch the surface of what I ask you, but that's fine because I know you. So I'll just get into it. I'll, I'll find you on social media and I'll just like, you know. So any yes. other, we have some time for questions from the audience, if there are any. Thank you so much for being such a lovely audience. Thank you. This book, with both of you, thank you so much. And I really do love how it tied into One City, One Book. If you haven't read The Chinese Groove, um, very similar um, trauma, but humor. So, yeah, and I think like um, what you hit on some things that rang for me and like what we read is how parents in particular, grandparents have this trauma and don't ever want to talk about it. And um, I've encountered, we, I had a book club with a Chinese groove and we had a really nice gentle older man who came. He was Chinese, Amer Chinese. he came to America when he was seven, but his family, abandoned him in China to come here and he was really suffering you know and he really opened up at this book club about his trauma it was like what okay thank you for sharing this with us and I think like you know parents and grandparents they definitely you know hear I mean trauma is like almost a new term like you know that wasn't even a thing for them so thank you very much for sharing that and um, Nancy yeah you have some really deep parental stuff going down in both your books <laughs> I love them both, though. Okay, so questions. Yes. Um, I, ca I can't wait to go home and, and read the book, so thanks to the library for making that uh, um, available to us. But since I don't have, yes, since I don't have uh, the, the background with the, with the reading before today, I'd like to know about your, let's say, for both of you, what would be your three major literary influences? I That's your I, three major literary influences. Okay, I, I can definitely, I'll start with Jhumpa Lahiri because when I was assigned to her in college, I, I've written pretty much my entire life and my characters were white until Jhumpa Lahiri. Because I didn't even register to me that they could look like me. Like between the TV that I consumed and the stories that I read, I was like, oh, okay, this is what you, and speaking of audiences, it's like, this is how you write. You write about people who look a certain way. And then I read Interpreter of Maladies and it blew my freaking mind. And I, the next short story I wrote was about a girl who looked like me and I never went back. And so I think um, that jumps out in my, in my mind. And then I think Zadie Smith, mm -hmm. uh, White Teeth, speaking of comedy, like White Teeth is funny. It is, she's, she's funny. And yeah. so that was a huge literary influence on me when I found that book. And I'm a big believer that the, a book will find you at the right time in your life. And I, I read 
I didn't read White Teeth when it came out. I, I, was, I probably wasn't ready for it. I read it, um, I think, in 2015, 2016, when I could really appreciate it. And, you know, speaking of just everything is fodder, my, like, learn from her execution and her craft and, and timelines and inter, intergenerational uh, narratives. And then the third one, I am... Um, I'm struggling with, which is why I was talking about white teeth for so long. But <laughs> if we chat after, I could maybe by then have the third one. After by the you. time I'm done. Yeah, maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah we'll I go back you to you. Time. I'll be like, number three. And now I'll do this interpretive <laughs> dance. Wow. The first three writers I always think of is I think of James Baldwin, Elena Ferrante, and Edith Wharton. These were all like... Uh, novelists that write things that uh, you see them on the paper and you're like, I've never seen that on paper before. Like the, uh, the intensity of the intimacy and the sort of scrutiny and the reality of everyday life. I feel like they just so, do such a beautiful job with while also talking about characters within a social, political, economic context. Like they are, they're not just, you know what I mean? Like they're not like characters in a vacuum. Like we're very well aware of the worlds that they're existing in and how that kind of invades everyday life. And so I love authors that kind of, another one that I think of is like Han Kang, who's a Korean author, um, Han Kang or the vegetarian um, human, yeah, human X, yeah, who really takes these sort of intimate, moments that you've just like never seen portrayed before but when you when you see them you're like shocked with the revelation of like I have never seen this on paper before and it is so real it is so awkward it is so painful but it's a delight to encounter because you realize you're just like not alone and I think that's what books do right I mean part of the thing is is to, to see how we're connected with each other in really magical ways regardless I mean our books are so different on the surface and yet I think we're really connected in such incredible ways and that's so important to us as like human beings to realize how not alone we are. And so those books, because they're also kind of political and social, are ones that uh, really kind of, I think about all the time and I'm kind of obsessed with in a way. So, and your third book. Everybody would have forgotten, <laughs> Nancy. Jesus. Oh, I wasn't moving uh, on. I'm totally kidding. Uh, I do have an answer. Uh, I think Elizabeth Strout's been a oh, phenomenal yeah. influence on me yeah. because with the characters of, in the novels following Olive Kitteridge and Lucy Barton, those separate novels, I love the idea of like you can create a character and then return to them and mm. create new worlds for them. Like you're not necessarily done with them. And it makes me very hopeful because before that, I think I thought of – uh, series, and I don't, I don't consider her work series, but the idea of returning to characters as more uh, YA than I did literary fiction. So it kind of opened up, like kind of banged down that door of possibility, which I love because I'm like, oh, do I want to return to these queens or what do I want to do? And it's just great <laughs> to like be like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lizzie. Out there, killing it. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you. I wanted to just kind of like commend you for having the courage to tell these stories because it's not easy and using fiction is a great way to like get past some of these traumatic experiences. And, you know, what I get is that in the process of writing for you, for you what I'm hearing is that it's a process of discovery, um, catharsis, and ultimately healing. So maybe... Um, would you like to maybe discuss the process and the challenges you have with regards to, um, you know, there, there are these like family silences, absences and secrets. And usually when you have such a huge gap, you're trying to work through those experiences. So through the process of fiction writing, how do you, in reimagining these stories, um, get to that point of reconciliation and um, re resolution? She's like family secrets and she looks at me. Um, thank you so much for that great question. That was so thoughtful. I was like, woo. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, how does this, well, you know, I, I spoke earlier about my father dying in a car accident, um, not being able to hear his side of the story. Uh, I think, you know, literary fiction, it's character driven. It allows you to see so many facets of an individual. Um, and I think the point of it is in so many ways to connect you in unexpected, you know, there's this, I, I like to think of 
all, you know, I, I think of it this way, all of my, you know, when people ask like, are any of these characters biographical or are they autobiographical? I like to think of it as, you know, all of these characters, I am all of these characters and I am also none of them, you know? And so being able to occupy the space of my father who was born in the 1930s, who was a survivor of war, who experienced hunger and who experienced death on a level that I could never imagine myself in my own personal life being a child of like 1980s Los Angeles, you know what I mean? Um, really, I feel is uh, created this bridge between me and him, um, his humanity, what the limits of his humanity, what the limits of the roles that he could play in my life were, that in so many ways he was kind of trapped in a war that he was unable to process. I think of the ways that the separations in my family, my father abandoned when my family when I was six years old. Um, and, and there's also many separations in my novels itself, but in real life, my father abandoned my family. And I think my father, and then I think about the ways that my father had to leave his mother and his siblings behind in a country that became divided from him in a border, which is the border between North and South Korea. And it, throughout his life, he was repeating borders and separations because he never processed or got over it. And sure, of course, my father, that doesn't mean I go back and my, I rewrite history and my father is suddenly a different man, but he's actually becomes a human being to me on a level that I think I can learn to live with. And so in some ways, writing a novel and even reading novels is learning to live with people that you might find despicable, that you might find committing crimes that you would never commit, you know, like murderers, name calling, cattiness, like I, how do I sympathize with these women? But it's this kind of bridge between um, imagining and sort of creating a space where we have a shared understanding of each other through the page. And it's very, very powerful. I mean, this is why books are extremely important. This is why books are in danger because they are so so powerful, you know, they are great connectors, they are great weapons. And so this shared humanity, this is like where all of our strength comes from as human beings, right? It's that I can understand my father and he's no longer my enemy through the process of writing this book. And I think that that is, I mean, I, I think, you know, that's why, that's why there's book bans, that's why libraries are so important, that's why it's so great all of you are here today because that supports the library, yeah. That was fantastic. I don't think I can. That was so <laughs> amazing. Well, let's all keep reading and writing. I mean, yeah. regardless of what your intent is, I like, you know, we have this, we live in a society that's so product oriented where it's like, if I can't publish this book, why should I write it? If I can't, you know, I've met people who are writing books simply for their children to read or for their friends to read. And I think that's beautiful. And I think all of that matters just as much as my book and Perini's book. I really do. I mean, I, I think it has the agree. power to change people's lives as much as our books do. And so uh, focusing so much on product rather than process and the joy of like discovering things about yourself through the process of writing them out, writing them down is really. Um, Absolutely. I mean, he, it's powerful. Um, hence the book bans because there's nothing as innocuous as a story and there's nothing as dangerous as a story. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's it's how I so think. Keep doing it. Yeah. That's a sign. <laughs> keep keep reading. Keep writing. Reading, keep buying yeah. books. Keep borrowing them any way you can. I mean, if you love books, don't let anyone take that away from you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, first and foremost, Nancy. Thank you. Oh. I just had the biggest takeaway. My father is not my enemy. So after being disowned and becoming a single mother, um, you just really hit the nail on the head with that. Oh my God. But to end on a high note, Harini. Thank you. But has your mother ever sent the book to Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> Thank no, you. That was my, so beautiful. Both, was, both sides of that coin were beautiful. Um, I... No, but uh, Oprah's team was given the book, not by my mother, but uh, through like agents or whatever for, you know, when, they, when, they, when they're considering adaptation. So I, I don't think she's read it, but I think her team has, is aware uh, of it in the world. But no, that, that is, I'll tell my mom. Yeah. She's slacking off. I'll be like, listen. She's really slacking off. Yeah, I know. Yeah. What? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'll send her a fresh list. 
she lives in like Montecito, right? Or is that where Oprah lives? Well, part of the time in Maui, right? And then part of the time. Oh, okay. So we even know where she lives, but. I'm sure my mom will find out. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> She's on it. She's resourceful. That was great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And thank you all for being here tonight. And please, if you didn't get a book, please get one, get two. If you have a friend, you can take one to them too as well. So yes. please do that. And thank you, Nancy Perini. Thanks oh so gosh. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anissa, for bringing this together. This is like thank pure magic that only happens at the library. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for being here, everyone.